So Jane is bringing us the word today. And if you don't know Jane Gomesall, she plays a big part here at the Beacon Church in the life of prayer for each one of us. Jane gets here early every Sunday and spends time praying for us as a church, praying for you uh, and also is so great at discerning the voice of God. Uh, I know I've been touched by Jane's prayers and her sharing what God's revealed to her, as I'm sure many of you here has as well. So Jane, we honor you for all the hours that you've put in for praying for us as a church. And we're excited to hear what uh, God is speaking through you today. So can you give a warm welcome, please, to Jane? Okay. Yes, good morning. Um, I am Jane, and um, I'm part of the wider leadership team here. Um, I live in Camberley, and um, hopefully we will have clicks working or not. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I live in Camberley um, with my husband, Ralph, who's down here on the front row. But I have uh, the extra parts of my family, the extra people that are related to me. Uh, I've got two sons, my daughter-in-law, two little grandchildren, and that's my mum there as well. Um, I think we're ready for a new family photo. Got a few more months, haven't we? A new family photo. Have you noticed how many babies we've got in church at the moment. Got lots of tiny little ones. I love having little babies in church. I love, you know, their feet. They've got such tiny little feet, haven't they? Lovely babies. And they're all clean and and lying snuggled up in in lovely little warm, woolly, white blankets. What I really love is um, I can have a little cuddle sometimes. And um, when... The service is finished and and we've all had our coffee and the parents can take those babies home. I am not the one who is going to be pacing the floor at 3 a.m. I'm not the one who's going to have stacks of washing. I'm like, do I wean now? Do I wait a week? All those things that new parents have to contend with. It's fair to say that babies as cute as they are like this, sometimes are like this. And they bring transformation, some might even say chaos, to your household. There is nothing left in a house that has got a new baby that is as it was before. Food. I mean, do you even get any when you've got a new baby? Your work schedule the um, the way that your household is run, your sleep, and don't even mention money, right? Before the baby, <laughs> after the baby. Of course, there are lots of challenges with having a new baby, but I don't think there is... No, I'm guaranteed that there is no new parent in this room that would want to take their baby back and go back to living without that little bundle in their life, even at 3 a.m. when you're pacing the floor, right? I have called today's message Transformed. We're, as we've said, on the final, the home straight of our story and our, the gospel, that, not the gospel, the book that we are looking at, which is Colossians. Whatever else we learn from the book of Colossians, learn this. If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then your life is going to change. Just like that new parent your life will look and feel totally different. Keep that thought. It's going to be reoccurring in what I say today. Actually, there's been some great opportunities this morning to hear part of our vision statement already, but I'm going to give it to you again. Because our vision statement as a church, the Beacon Church here, is that we are working towards being a growing church where lives are transformed and community is built. We're going to have you all reciting it before very long. And Paul, as he writes this, the final bit of what he says to the Colossians, is going to be talking about these things that transform us and therefore transform our community. 
The first thing he says is, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Why is Paul telling these Christians that they need to pray? Other than the fact that, of course, every biblical author says we need to pray, right? It's a good thing to do. Well, I think he's saying, given the first three chapters, the chapters we have, the first bit of the letter that he's written to them, there are some things that are going to be a challenge. There's some things that he wants them to put into their lives, some transformations he wants them to make. He's already talked to them about what your marriage might look like if you're going to become a follower of Jesus. He's talked to them about what your job is going to be like, whether you're an employer or an employee. And so I think he's telling to them, because of these things, you are going to have to pray. He's saying to them, there's been some things that have come into the Colossian church that have made you get a little bit off the rails in your thinking. And because we don't want that to happen, Colossian church, Please pray. You see, to pray is to plan for transformation. When we pray, we are planning with God for our how we are going to be transformed. And to pray is to let God do that transformation within us. He says, be watchful, people because it's easy to fall prey to the culture around you. I vividly remember a dis very disturbing night many years ago. I was a student. I was in halls of residence, and um, I was woken in the early hours of the morning to the sound, the blaring sound of the fire alarm, which until that moment I had not realized was positioned right outside my door. I was fully aware that there was smoke coming under my door. The fire alarm was blaring, there was smoke, and I was at actually right, fully aware of where I was and what was going on, even though seconds before I'd been fast asleep. You see, what had happened was I went to college in, in um, Winchester, to do my teacher training. And uh, in November, in the streets of Winchester, there's a torch lit pr procession. And then there's a big bonfire with lots of fireworks. And these torches, I don't know if they still use them, actually quite dangerous. Um, but these torches had been brought back into the halls of residence by a couple of my friends. And they'd put them in the kitchen overnight absolutely thinking that they were extinguished. About 3 a.m., one of them began to smolder and spark, which set the fire alarm off. The following day, there was a whole, um, having been evacuated by a whole host of really rather gorgeous firemen, three fire engines full of firemen. Actually, they told us all off because we'd come out without our shoes, but there you go. Um, I was so thankful that those fire alarms had alerted the firemen to come. Because we know that smoke is a silent killer. We've seen the adverts, haven't we? Most of us have smoke alarms in our homes. Smoke coming under the door can be like the things that are around us in our culture, in the news, in the politics around us, in the books we read, in the films that we watch things that Jesus is asking us to pay extra attention to, things that are not good for us to imbibe as followers of Jesus. I want to propose a few of these things to you. Do we have a tendency to expect as followers of Jesus that we should have an easy life, that our lives will follow an upward trajectory in terms of comfort or maybe our personal happiness, our, our self-autonomy um, means that we can do what we want. What about this one? I know I have character flaws. Some people might say they were sin. But actually, 
that's too difficult to change, and so therefore I'm going to just let Jesus love me as I am. The spiritual battle is just a picture in the Bible and not a reality. Is that something that we have allowed to come into our minds? Or maybe that society would have us believe that tolerance is always a virtue and that technology is the answer for everything. These might not be things that affect you, but they might be. And they are like this smoke coming under the door. The early signs that something is not wrong, that we've believed something that is not true. They might knock you off course. They might be the silent killer for spiritual maturity in your life or passion for Jesus. You see, what I want is for my life to be transformed intentionally by Jesus, not unintentionally by the things around me. And I particularly want that for my children and for your children. I want them to be purposefully transformed by Jesus. Paul goes on. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Do you know that God has purposefully placed you where you live with the people you work with, the friends you go to the gym with, in order that you might be a voice into their lives? Many people right now in our country are carrying a deep sense of unsettling. They might not have verbalized that, But is it any wonder when we've seen riots on our streets, when there's war in Europe, when there's confusion over gender? God has a mission for you and I to speak into people's lives. Paul calls these open doors. Quite simply, it's a chance to talk to people around us about Jesus. Maybe you might say, is there anything I can pray for you? Or if they tell you something, you could say, would it be okay if I prayed for you? No one has ever said no when I've said that. Or maybe you could remind an adult child that you continue to pray for them, even though you and they know that they're not going on with God right now. Or maybe to reply to a neighbor who recently said to me, were you always religious? And I explained, no, Jesus was somebody I'd chosen to follow. You're not born a follower of Jesus just because you're born with a British passport. You have to opt in. These are God's open doors. Bizarrely, Paul has open doors and he knows that, even though Paul writes this letter behind closed doors. His actions and his speech, even where he is, have turned many to follow Jesus. Did you know that when Paul was in prison, he had a guard chained to him full time? And they changed the guard every four hours. Some of you in this room will be like, I'd have done four hours sitting with Paul. There are a few things I really want to ask him about. These guards were perfectly placed to hear everything Paul had to tell them. They couldn't get away from him. They could hear about the shipwrecks he'd been in, the miraculous changes of food, 
He could tell them about who Jesus was for him. They couldn't get away from him singing praise. You know, there are many people around us that seem like there are closed doors. Maybe right now you're even thinking of some of those people. But most people have a little bit of them that's not a closed door, it's slightly ajar. And this week, I think God is giving you opportunities where you could just see that ajar door. God is giving you a shoe in for some conversations with people this week. It's not difficult, make it easy. People don't need a sermon, they don't need theology. It's okay to be vulnerable. Don't get sidetracked into sticky topics. No one can deny your own personal story. If you don't have the answers, then tell them that Alpha is coming in a few weeks' time and the Alpha leaders can answer the sticky questions. You just tell them about who Jesus is for you. And could you... Oh, no, I missed a bit. And could you believe that those doors that are closed would be doors that would be open in a few days or weeks or months to come? I believe that we are coming to a season where God is opening doors all around us. Did you know that 2024 is the Jewish year of open doors? For Jews, this is a year when they will see God opening doors around them. And people are often giving us opportunities to do that. What God opens, no one can shut. And could you pray for those who preach the gospel? Could you pray for Adrian? Most of you know that he is our lead elder, our pastor, but he's also head of a charity called John 316, and he goes all over the place speaking God's word to people. And this summer, he was at the New Day Festival. I think this is from a, actually from a couple of years ago, but this is what it looks like. He's got people up giving testimony to who Jesus is. And he loves that. You've seen him doing that up here on the stage, haven't you? And you know that he loves it. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. Would you pray for him that he has the ability to see tangible and abundant fruit that would encourage him? Do you remember at the beginning, are you still with me? You've not fallen asleep. Good. Um, at the beginning, I said we were going to be a church where lives are transformed and where people look and act and sound like Jesus. Well, this passage says that we are to be seasoned with salt, which is what we've just spoken about. But what about if seasoned with salt wasn't just speaking about Jesus? What if it was speaking like Jesus? You know, our speech should be consistent with our faith. Above all else, it should be truthful. This isn't something that we often talk about from this platform, but I sense God, every time I've tried to take this piece out of what I'm going to say this week, God has told tell me to put it back in. Are there people here for whom telling the truth has just slipped a little? Saving your skin in a tricky situation or exaggerating to promote yourself or your story. Or maybe you've allowed swearing and cursing to become things that come to your lips too frequently. You know, God is more than able to redeem our speech. Part of being transformed is that we will become pure vessels to hold his spirit At this point, most Bibles, and um, even ones on your phone, will have the heading, Final Greetings. So you might be tempted to think, great, 
important stuff's done. Paul's had his say. Let's bring the band back and we can all have a cup of coffee and go home. But actually, I'm not done. Just as Paul wasn't done, he specifically concluded his letter with personal remarks that he wanted to make to the people he knew, his friends, his co-workers. This was a crucial part of his letter to the Colossians. Paul was writing to them who were a growing church, a community of people in relationship with one another, and he had personal things to say to them. And if you will give me the liberty, I've got a few personal things that I want to say to those of you who consider the Beacon Church to be part, to be your home. I want to talk about what it's going to look like if we are a growing church where lives are transformed and community is built. So bear with us because this is quite a long passage of scripture. Ticketus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, and he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner... Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, send greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you so that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Herapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you have completed the ministry you received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. My gosh, what a lot of tricky names. Who are all these people? Well, I actually don't have time to tell you much about some of them. It's great to have a look um, at just in the back of a Bible. If you've got one with concordance, you can find out who these people were. You can look back into the other parts of the New Testament and you can see where they pop up. Because what I really want to home in on is what Paul thinks about these people. And that, I think, is going to give us a few hints, a few tips about how we should be in relationship with others around us. I think above all else, we can see that people believed in, that Paul believed in people. He was continually encouraging them. He was calling them out. He was giving them opportunities. He was sending them off on missions. He was drawing them back in to where he was to give them a little tip on something. And then he's sending them out again. He absolutely believes in people. He relied on them, and he knew that they relied on him. This was two-way relationship for Paul. I think Paul made it work with people who were very different from him. He had friends who were Jews. We've heard Justus, Mark, and Aristarchus. And he had friends who weren't, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. Do you know, that meant there were potential for clashes. They, I'm sure, all had different ways to do church. 
18 people, 18 different opinions on how to lead the worship and when to read the Bible passage. Some wanted to eat together. Some found that really hard because they were Jewish and they had lots of food rules. Some had religious backgrounds that meant there were things that were really important to them that they were going to have found really hard to lay to one side so that they could bear with somebody else in their church. They needed to work that out just like us. Do you know the UK church is one of the most diverse groups that you could belong to? We are diverse in culture, language, the nations we come from, the color of our skin, our age, our social status. And in case you hadn't noticed, the beacon is particularly diverse enjoy that. You get a chance to meet people from all over the world who do life differently, and that is such an exciting thing to be part of. It might take a bit of effort. You might have to eat a bit of food you're not sure about, but it is well worth it. It's an opportunity that you probably won't have for the rest of this week. This time here together is so special. And Paul didn't do life alone. We've seen that, all these people that he had in his life. Another thing that might take a bit of effort is being part of a small group. I wonder if you might think about that again if you're not part of a group. See how it might work for you. We've got new groups, and it might be that it actually is better for you now. The time might work better, better. the location might look, work better. Or maybe you think, actually, none of those things work for me, but do you know, God could, could lead a small group through me. There's an old adage that says that faith will bring you to church, but your friends will keep you there. Friends make the difference, and we thrive when we're in community together. Finally, I think Paul had the gift of forgiveness. He maintained good relationships with people because he lived unoffended. We know from a passage in Acts 15 that he'd had a bit of a falling out with Mark, with Mark and with Barnabas, and yet both of those are mentioned in this passage. He'd obviously made up with them. He knew how to restore relationships. One of the reasons why Paul said at the very beginning of what we were talked about this morning was that we need to pray is because this is not easy. I'm going to read to you just a couple of verses from Colossians 3, which is uh, the passage we had a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. Be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. That's others here. Be compassionate. Show kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble. Unoffendable in your patience with others. Tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith forgiving one another in the same way that you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault with someone, release this same gift of forgiveness to them. This is the verse you probably will know. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Now, I'm not saying if people are in sin that we need to ignore it. Of course we don't. But do you need to have a sense of gentleness toward them? Do you need to be unoffended when they speak something to you? You don't need to have the last word all the time. It makes me really sad when I hear of people in um, this church that are at loggerheads with one another, where they, degree, where they disagree 
and their disagreement comes over and above their love for each other. You know, God wants us to be people who are transformed by his love. And I think that actually we are in a season now where he is sifting our prized opinions. Our opinions about how we do life as a follower of Jesus. Our opinions about what it looks like on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. The Holy Spirit is moving here to purify us. And he's beginning to do that in our hearts. Do you know, the last few months, God has been on my case again and again and again about people that I have thought things about that was either not true or was definitely unkind and not gracious. He has been picking me up at every turn. And actually... I found it really hard. And as as I got to this point in what I've written down, I was just aware of God saying to me, this is the way that he brings holiness to us, to me. He's shifting things that I had put on a pedestal as absolutely crucial for the way we do church. And he's saying to me, take it off. People are more important. My love for you is more important than knowing I'm right or thinking I am. People will know that I am a follower of Jesus by the relationships that I have with you. They will see and hear my words Jesus said, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Perhaps the band would like to get ready to come back now. What an amazing place to finish not only what I'm going to say this morning, but the whole of the series of Colossians with Jesus' words echoing here, love one another. This is not an easy transformation. For me, it's been painful. But it's one I know I'm called to, and so are you. And it's one that God has been empowering me to. He's given me extra grace. Eugene Peterson, who you probably know as the author of the Message Bible, says this. Friendship is every bit as important in your relationship with Jesus as prayer and fasting. I believe that God is calling us to walk across the room to people this morning and in the coming days, weeks and months with that gift of forgiveness. He's calling you to be unoffendable that you would put what you think to one side in order that you can love someone else better. He's calling you to start relationships that might cost you financially, that might cost you time, that might cost you a bed in your house or a place at your table. They might cost you your pride or your carefully constructed theology. Are you willing for God to come in such a way into your heart that he would continue or begin that transformation within you? You know, Jesus wants us to love others exceptionally well because isn't it good when we know that we are loved? To love so that others feel loved is what we are called to do. I think actually we do this well already, but there is such a high bar. Jesus loved us to the point of death. Are you willing for him to access your life? 
to set in place that transformation that we've talked about. I don't want this to be an easy decision for you because it's going to change you. But also because it's going to change people around you. Because this is the way that people will see Jesus before they know him for themselves. They will see him in you. They will see him in the way you speak. They will see him in your gentleness with them and with each other here. Remember, I said at the start that if you believe Jesus is who he says he is, then your life is going to change. And if you want to go on with God, and that's your choice, then my friends, this is where the rubber hits the road. I hope you will excuse me for having spoken personally to each one of you. You know that my heart is for you and for us as a church. And primarily my heart is that Jesus will come and transform you because what he's been doing in my life has been quite spectacularly difficult (laughs) and beautiful. And I hope that you and I will grow together to be a transformed community that love each other exceptionally well. Thank you. Hey guys, before you go, we just want to say a massive thank you for watching this video today. My name's Chris. I'm part of the leadership team here at the Beacon Church. You know, as a church, we have a big vision. We believe that we exist to help people to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference. If this video has made a difference in your life today, then make sure you check out our other content in our playlist. We believe it's going to really help you out. And don't forget to like and subscribe as you go. Well, that's all from me today. Take care. God bless.